An elite member of society who should have been of a high status, Ezekiel was instead a captive within Babylon. While feeling the distance between himself and the Lord's temple, the Lord extended a hand of hope, calling him as a prophet in less than ideal circumstances. If we are willing, God will come to us wherever we are. Places and moments in our lives can be made sacred by the communion we share with deity in what may be some of our darkest moments. I invite you to join us in our study today and encourage each of us to request divine understanding that the Spirit can teach us individually and specifically. Welcome to Come Follow Up. All prophets have experienced some adversity at some point. I mean, some, is, some of them have been to great effects and other ones haven't been as bad, but Satan wants to stop this plan. He knows how important it is the whole time. And so just depending on what's happening, there's going to be things that are going to come in the way. That's, that's just the process. I think that sometimes when people have sinned or done something wrong and they know it, they kind of try to put it out of their mind and they try to think, well, no, that's not right. I didn't do that. I'm fine. I'm doing fine. So I think when prophets tell them you need to repent, you need to do better, it kind of makes them feel guilty. So they um, persecute them and say that they're, they're lying and they're not telling the truth. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here with us today. The discussion topics come from our studies in the book of Ezekiel. And the first topic is Ezekiel, a prophet in exile. And the second topic is the Lord is gathering his people and giving them new life. And to help us with our discussion today, we want to first welcome back one of our scholars, James Goldberg. James is a writer, poet, historian uh, for the Department of History for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And our guest today, seated next to James, is Tyler Griffin. Tyler is a professor of ancient scripture at BYU, and he and his wife are raising 10 children. That's right. How do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> One day at a time. Never a dull moment. <laughs> Never a Griffin dull moment. Home. Well, thank you so much for, for being here with us today. Okay, so our first topic, Ezekiel, a prophet in exile. Let's just get to know Ezekiel a little bit, if that's okay. Uh, I'm going to give James and then Tyler, if you want to give Absolutely. us a little bit of information on Ezekiel. Sure. I mean, if we look right at the beginning of the book of Ezekiel, he starts telling us things, right? Uh, so it says here, Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Chabar, that the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. So... When it says captives here, Jeremiah had warned the people they'd go into captivity in Babylon. Ezekiel's there, okay. right? He's one of the first group that were taken captive before the whole city of Jerusalem was destroyed and everyone else came. So if you're comparing the Book of Mormon, you've got Jeremiah and Lehi, who are both prophets, warning about the destruction of Jerusalem. Ezekiel's more a contemporary of Nephi, okay. right? They're that next generation where all their heritage comes from living in the promised land, and here they are pulled out of it okay. and dropped down somewhere else. The other thing to consider here is the fact that had Ezekiel still been living in Jerusalem right after um, Lehi and his family left is when, shortly after, is when he gets taken captive. This would have been his 30th birthday, which would have been the time when he would have been ordained officially as a priest. He would have taken his place in the temple and in that priestly class back in Jerusalem, and yet he's lost all of that. It's all been taken away from him, and for five years he's been out here in this exiled position feeling like, what could I have done differently? And, and possibly feeling like he's been forsaken. We move around a lot now, right? That's just part of our society. Right. So it might be hard for us to understand what a big deal it is to be pulled up. If you're from a priestly family and your world revolves around that temple, right? To be, to be pulled away out of all of that and, and wind up captive here, like it's, it's existential level trouble. This okay. is not just he happens to live somewhere else. In the 137th Psalm, they talk about this. He'd mentioned being by that river. And this psalm opens, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. And then it describes them being asked to sing a song from their homeland. And in verse four, it says, 
How shall we sing the Lord's songs in a strange land? Not only is he taken from home, but he almost doesn't know who he is anymore, right? Outside of that temple context and holy city context. Uh, we had a question come in from one of our viewers that is really gonna help us understand what they're going through and how we can see some similarities in our time as well. Hi, my name's Marissa. I'm from Johnson City, Tennessee. My question revolving around Ezekiel is, he's having this vision and seeing the wickedness of the world. And my question is, how is the difference of the wickedness from the world back in Ezekiel's time versus the wickedness in our day and age? How can we spot wickedness in our day and age when it seems to be just melded into kind of every faucet of our lives, essentially? It's fascinating when you look at that. Great question, by the yeah. way, Marissa, because honestly, if we can't go into the scriptures and understand them in their context and then bridge the gap to our day, then we just become experts in history, right? We have a variety of ways that we can experience wickedness that maybe they couldn't in the past. It doesn't matter what it is. If it's pointing us towards anything other than God and what he has for us, his covenant path, it doesn't matter whether it's through modern technological means or ancient idol worship. The devil doesn't care. Anything to get us turned away from God and towards self, towards money, power, pride, um, honors and glory of the world, whatever it may be, he doesn't care. Maybe it shows up in different forms, but I think that fundamental human desire to, to exercise power over others, to punish, like it's still with us. So yeah, it doesn't look the same from the outside, but I wonder in the heart whether, whether God sees a lot of the same things playing out within us. Okay, so uh, with the audience, I wanna focus on the second part of this question. How can we spot wickedness in our day? Tasha. I find it valuable to get my kids' perspective on it. They are uh, in the world. They're seeing a lot at school, and they are really perceptive, and they know that I think they have a good sense of, of right and wrong and wickedness. And so I like to ask my kids, like, what do you see going on and what's happening in your world? Let's figure this out together, not just me telling them. Okay, well, thank you for sharing, because I think it's important for us to understand that sometimes it's not as, it's not always easy to, you know, when you're invited to participate in something, you may not always recognize it as some wicked or evil thing at first. The adversary is kind of tricky like that. Yeah, and I think in the Doctrine and Covenants, it'll talk a lot about a corrupt generation or what are the sins of the generation. And Ezekiel's time, that's definitely the case, right? If everybody around you is seeing the world a certain way, it can be hard to recognize that, no, this thing actually is a problem, okay. is a concern. And he's going to be taken out <laughs> of his home context and here at this place where he's with other people who have been taken captive, starting to think deeply, right? And trying to reflect on, on what went wrong, how do we get here, and maybe compelled to see some of those sins of the generation that we get desensitized to. Okay. Now, so we, we talk about this word exile, Tyler, yeah. and how is the, the, you know, our first topic, you know, Ezekiel's a prophet in exile. Yeah. Uh, can you touch on that word a little bit and how we can kind of connect with it? Yeah, that's actually a really important concept for us to, to wrestle with for a minute. But at kind of a 10,000 foot overview level, you'll notice how often in your own life, God seems to enjoy leaving you in a comfort zone. Have you noticed how short those comfort zones seem to be? where he then takes you out of a comfort zone and you end up in some sort of a wilderness. In, in Ezekiel's case, it's out here at the river in exile where he feels cut off. But there's something powerful, this pattern throughout scriptures and throughout our life where you recognize that just because bad things have happened to you and you, you feel like you're cut off from all of that comfort zone and all of those those family structures or those those jobs or that education or whatever it was. Or can we say bad or challenging or trying? Correct. Okay. You could have somebody feeling like they're in exile due to addiction 
or due to a lost job or lost health or a loss of a loved one or a lost opportunity or due to abuse from other people. It has nothing to do with anything you did, but all of a sudden you find yourself cut off from, from what used to be your comfort zone and because you're in exile and you feel this separation, it's a, it's a scary, but it's a beautiful place to be because you can no longer rely on the strength of your own flesh or your own intellect. It, it almost forces you more than ever before to turn to God and say, I can't do this alone. I need help. And ironically with Ezekiel, he's out there for five years. Now, we read that very quickly and say, like, oh, it was just five years. But it didn't, <laughs> it didn't pass very quickly for Ezekiel. Those five years are, are hard. Yeah. Those are trying and those are difficult. And, and we recognize that today there are many people who, who may be watching who have passed through exile kinds of experiences for decades yeah. and wondering, am I forgotten? Am I forsaken? And the message of Ezekiel is, you're never forgotten. Has there been a time where you, you have felt like you were in exile and then maybe you're like, all right, I need you, where are yeah. you? Would you mind sharing something with us? Yeah, um, did we mention before that I, I have 10 children. <laughs> um, there, have been, there have been countless experiences, too, too numerous to, to even um, recall all of them, where there come these moments when you realize, I don't have a clue of what to do right now, and I need help. So it comes in parenting moments. Earlier on in the mission, I'll never forget those first two to three days down in Brazil when I arrived in the mission field. Uh, I thought I had been dropped off of the end of the world. I had left all of my comfort zone and I felt completely exiled and thinking, two years of this? I, I can't survive this. I need help. And that was one of those, you know, you've, you've had these before, those soul-defining moments where you get to the end of your, your rope of faith and you're clinging on with fingernails of faith and you say, I need help. I need something because I've run out of rope. I, I don't know if I can do this. And God in his goodness finds ways to, to give you that comfort and help you realize, I have not forsaken you. You're not in exile the way you think you're in exile, you're growing, I am with you, stick with me. Well, I hope that there's a lot of young men and young women out there that are listening to that, that may be in that position that can think, okay, have a little, have a little hope, hang I'm gonna there. hang on. So when have you, like Ezekiel, felt distance from God, but still felt him reaching out to you? Jessica. Um, there's a lot of moment that I feel like God was reaching out to me, but the one that stood out to me right now was, um, I, I remember I was like feeling down and um, I was just mad at him. I was like, show me, show me that you're, you're there. Show me that there's a God. And um, at that moment, like I heard someone knock on the door and then I looked through the door and I saw the, the missionaries and I open it and there's like, hey, we're missionaries from the Church of Jesus Christ. I was like, I know who you are. And it's like right immediately after I like I was complaining to him. So that was the moment right there for me. And then Jessica, um, how has that experience strengthened your relationship with God? Every time I have like I feel down, I always go back to that moment. It's like I know you're there. I'm just stubborn. And but I know that you love me. And that you'll always be there for me. That makes me feel good, you know, because there are moments when I think we all are like that. And to, to hear an experience like that gives me hope that, you know what, I can, I can get through some of those, those lonely times in my life. So thank you so much. Any thoughts in response to what Jessica has to say? Well, I just have a similar memory. When, when I was a missionary, we called a member who hadn't been to church in a long time, and he told us later he'd been... Just before that, he'd, he'd seen his scriptures on the shelf, hadn't gotten them out in a long time, but just got it out and was looking at these scriptures again and then kind of looked to the phone and this call came, right? Wow. And I thought this, this experience isn't, isn't for me, this is experiences for him to just let him know that, that God's still with him and he was living as a foreigner in that country, right? 
And, and that has its own challenges when yeah. you're getting used to a place. So he was literally in exile when God reached out to remind him, I'm always there. I'm always there for you. Uh, thank you, James. Anything else that we can learn about as far as Ezekiel and his mission, uh, what he's being called to do uh, that you want to share? If you look at the book of Ezekiel, it's, it's two halves of opposites. So in the first half, as you're reading through, it's he gets this amazing vision and all of the wickedness and the scattering and the going into exile and the Babylonian conquest and all the bad things happening. The second half of the book is going to be the reverse of all of those. And it's not because the people are so good, it's because God is so good. He's gonna provide a new heart for them. He's gonna give them a new hope. Uh, Book of Ezekiel is gonna come up with that long before Star Wars came up with <laughs> a new hope. But it's that idea of Ezekiel's being called to go and tell the people all these bad things that are happening and why they're happening, but it's not a message of doom and gloom. It's a message of, yeah, we're struggling and bad things are gonna keep happening, but there's hope and we've gotta trust God and he's going to restore all of these bad things that are happening to us and we're gonna get back and then some what we've lost. I know there's a lot more we can get into about Ezekiel, Ezekiel in the footnotes portion of this episode, uh, but this has been a really productive conversation about our first topic, Ezekiel, a prophet in exile. Heavenly Father speaks to me through the small things that other people do. Like just giving me a smile, sometimes that tells me something and it, just the small things. God often speaks to me through ideas, thoughts that originated out of nowhere but come to my mind that inspire me to take action or to think about something in a way that I've never thought before. I feel like a lot of it is through the scriptures. I found when I have problems, I turn to the scriptures and almost immediately, it can be like in the first verse or that chapter that I find answers or just even a feeling of peace come over me as I'm reading. I've learned personally that as I write these thoughts down and ponder them, really take that time to just, just think about it, like, hey, what does this thought mean to me? It grows. And, you know, President Nelson says that that's how we grow in the principle of revelation, and uh, that excites me. So the second topic we're going to discuss today is the Lord is gathering his people and giving them new life. Uh, Tyler, do you want to introduce us into what we're going to be talking about next? Yeah, absolutely. Like we, like we said in the first half, it seems like they've lost everything. So we need a restoration. So there's, we've talked a lot about the scattering and the exile, but now you get this great gathering uh, motif that comes in. And if you look in chapter 36, verse 25, what, what a beautiful introduction to this, to this change. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Did you notice who's gonna do the cleaning? Who's gonna do this cleansing? It's not the people. It's the Lord who's going to come and do that for them. And then verse 26 is one of my favorite verses in the entire Old Testament. A new heart also will I give you. Notice, I will give it to you. It's not things that, that we have to do ourselves. We're not our own savior. The Lord Jesus Christ is providing this for them. And then he goes on, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. I, I don't know about you, but that to me gives me hope when I feel at times hopeless. Like I have tried to overcome certain things again and again and again, and I think, I, I'm never gonna get this. <laughs> and this verse reminds me, just hold on to your connection with, with the Lord. And when the timing is right and everything's according to his will, he replaces that, that stony heart of mine with a heart of flesh. Great hope. That is great hope. I think the, the story of the gathering is a story of, of hope. And, and we've talked about Ezekiel as, as a visionary man. And, um, and there's some really great visions and imagery that we get in this chapter that help teach us about the gathering. Uh, should we start with some of these visions and see how we can connect them to the gathering? 
Yeah, if you look at the very next chapter, chapter 37, Ezekiel has this vision of a valley full of bones, right? Which is a really vivid vision I thought for... you said these were like happy... Chat. <laughs> what, where, now we're going in bones? What now, you... now just watch. The, the, watch the new life, the new hope come. <laughs> okay. Right? So the bones are acknowledging, here's all the suffering, right? We're in captivity. A lot of people were killed. This is what it feels like. And then in, in verse 3... Uh, the Lord says to Ezekiel, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. And then if we skip down to five and six, thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and will cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So then this whole valley full of bones, Ezekiel watches as this, this wind comes over it, God's breath, and, and everything is assembled up again. And there's this, this beautiful image of, of death turning to life. It's such a powerful image for, for him in this context to see, yes, all this bad stuff had happened, but God can actually bring to life that which we, no other person could do this. Nobody could go into that valley and pick up those bones and put them together and put sinew and flesh and breathe air into them, but the Lord can. So many times things inside of us feel like they've died or we've lost something, the Lord can restore those. There are many people today who have rifts in their families, who have rifts in relationships and God can bring those back together as well. well what about from, from here in the audience? Uh, when have you felt the Lord breathe new life into a specific circumstance uh, within your own life? Ben. You know, a while back, I felt like I was at the top of my game. Everything was going great. And then I uh, was playing basketball, broke my ankle, dislocated it the whole nine yards. It was, it was awful but it really gave me perspective of what is so important. You feel like it's a setback, but it's just a little, little course correction, a little change, and it just sends you in the right direction. So what did you find was the most important thing from this experience? Well, your relationship with God, family, uh, obviously, the, you know, those that are married relationship with your spouse, you know, those are the things that you start to quickly realize, man, your phone, your social media, everything, it's just, it just starts to become these distractions. And you think, boy, what, you know, where, where are the priorities? Yeah, well, thanks, Ben, for sharing that. And thanks for giving us that added perspective. Yeah. So moving on, we have uh, this other vision that Ezekiel has. Tyler, you want to take, take that this one? one? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what you get in this vision is from chapter 40 to 46, you, you get all kinds of descriptions and measurements, and, and he's painting this visual picture for us of a new temple. Because remember, Babylon is going to destroy the temple in Jerusalem, and it's going to be laid low, and it's later on when the Persians come and send the Israelites back under Nehemiah and Ezra to rebuild the temple, but it's laid low. And in these chapters, you get this vision of the temple rebuilt. And I don't know that the scholars all agree on whether this refers to Herod's second temple or the temple at the time of Jesus being rebuilt or the temple being rebuilt back in Ezra and Nehemiah's time or if it's a Latter-day temple that is yet to be rebuilt. They, they would call it the third temple. Uh, so you get all this description and most people would just glaze over as they read through these long passages describing the, the length and the breadth and the width and what's happening there. But the, the neatest part of the vision to me is once the temple is complete, it's new. Again, this whole book, Ezekiel, it's about you, you lose these things in the beginning half and God gives you a restoration. It's even better than what you had before. It's this newness of life, a new hope, a new temple in this context. And once it's built, then you have this amazing vision, one of the, I think, one of the neatest analogies 
for the infinite atonement of Jesus Christ that I can find in Scripture where he sees this little trickle of water coming out of the temple, and as it comes down and it starts to flow, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you know where Jerusalem's temple is, um, coming out the east, it would go down into the Kidron Valley, which is right where the garden called Gethsemane is, right there across from, from the temple up on the hill. The water would run down the Kidron Valley and then down into the Dead Sea um, in the south. This vision is amazing because the water comes out and it gets more and more and more and more, and by the time you get to the end of the vision, the Dead Sea isn't so dead anymore. Mm. The Dead Sea, which, by the way, is the lowest place on earth that you can walk today. It, it is as low as you can go. Wow. And if you go to the Dead Sea, there there is nothing living in that. It is so salty. It is so terribly filled with brine. Nothing can live there until this water from the temple trickles down. I don't know about you, but that to me is one of the most beautiful images or metaphors for all of our efforts as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to do work on both sides of the veil to gather Israel, is we go to the temple to bring new life to that which it's totally dead. There's nothing there. And by the time you get to the end of chapter 47, it is just teeming with life by this time. It, it is green. It's luscious. It, it's a new creation taking us back to kind of allusions back to the original Garden of Eden kind of a feeling is what comes out of this vision. You know, and there's some pretty strong application when we talk about nowadays and, and that that temple and how our participation in the temple continues to grow and bring new life. And I'm really, I really like what you said, Tyler, about on both sides of the veil. So um, in this idea of bringing new life through, through the temple, uh, how have you seen that? How have you felt uh, that strength, that newness of life uh, through on both sides of the veil through your work in the temples? Sean. My family is a uh, come-together family, so stepdad and other siblings along with my family. Through marriage, we were able to join together, but we weren't sealed in the temple yet together. Uh, we eventually decided that it was time. It was an interesting experience as you can feel a union form, not just in this physical standing within a family, but spiritual as well. Because it doesn't erase what your old family used to be, it just adds to it. And I think it's a really beautiful thing. Sean, how has that changed between your family relationships? You know, the funny thing is with family is that you're always going to argue still. You're always going to have your collisions with each other. But the, at the end of the day, you still have that feeling where you know that no matter what, they'll always be with you and that you can turn to them for help. And sometimes it's hard to swallow your pride to do so, especially myself personally. But I can feel it as time goes on and you mature and you follow throughout the scriptures, you realize who really has your back and that you strengthens your relationship to the point where there's nothing that you can't talk to them about. And there's nothing that they can't talk to you about either. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Tyler, you want to give us any final thoughts on uh, the book of Ezekiel or anything else we've touched on? Yeah, you know, remember the very opening vision of seeing this throne chariot coming out of the temple and, and he sees it out here at this river out in Babylon? Well, in these closing chapters, he sees that divine throne chariot rolling into the temple again, back into the place where any priest in, in ancient Israel would have expected the presence of God to be. I love this gathering of Israel perspective, not just for those people thousands of years ago, thousands of miles away from us, but for the gathering that God is doing with me and with my family and with my ancestors and with my children and my students 
and my ward members and my friends and my associate that same sociality that exists among us here, that idea. I love this sense of Christ being the, the great unifier, the bringer together of all that is good and restoring newness. That is what the at one meant is all about. It's, it's gathering us together in Christ. And there's just, there's so much hope for all of us, regardless of where you are personally or in your family, there's hope for a glorious bright future if that hope is centered in Christ. So great thoughts, Tyler. And I know there's a lot more to come uh, as we will discuss in, uh, in footnotes, but this has been really fun. Um, I'm excited. I don't think I'll ever teach the book of Ezekiel uh, the same again. So thank you so much for, for both of you for your comments. And thank you uh, in the audience for your contributions uh, today into our second uh, discussion topic. The Lord is gathering his people and giving them new life. One of the insights that I received today was that we're not alone um, in our exile. You know, Ezekiel was a prophet of exile and he had to leave his home and he realized that he wasn't alone. Jesus was there. And I feel like that's really important because everybody at one time or another will feel like they're alone or that they've been abandoned. And so I think for me to be able to know that we never are, I can hopefully take that out and maybe share that with others or just let them know that you know, someone is out there who understands and knows what they're going through. Today in our discussion, I, I felt just a lot of love from God um, coming through in different ways, coming through other people's answers, but just coming through the fact that despite everything that's going on in the world, there's still a way for us to come together and talk about God and talk about scriptures and talk about the things that bring us hope. Welcome to Come Follow Up Footnotes. All right, guys, I'm really excited. I don't know if we ever had this many props <laughs> at one time. And so, so I'm really excited for this. It can be challenging sometimes as we read about a lot of the symbols and a lot of the things that are said in the book of Ezekiel. Can we just talk about that and help us make sense of it? Because I think if we can understand some of these symbols, it'll help us kind of better understand the message from Ezekiel. Absolutely. An interesting scenario unfolds as you get into the Old Testament because it's kind of a clash of two ways of thinking, ways of approaching life in general. Because we today, at least in Western modern culture, we're influenced so heavily by, by the Greek way of thinking and the Greek way of approaching life, which is it's very literal and it's very individualistic. Okay. We, we build our identity based on me and, and my immediate family. That is not the way it is in ancient Israel. These are Hebrew people and their identity was firmly found and rooted in the larger house of Israel or their tribe it, it, and it's generational. And the Hebrew approach to life is extremely symbolic. It's not literal often. It's, they'll, paint, they'll paint lots of metaphorical pictures for you that end up having layer upon layer upon layer of symbolic meaning and capacity for you to liken that story or that symbol to your life differently at different times and in different situations in your life. And then somebody else can do the same thing. Okay. And if you think about it, like a math teacher, right? <laughs> Greek thought is ideal for that sort of setting where you're talking about abstract propositions and just, just teaching truths. But if you try to read the Bible like a math textbook, it's not going to work very well, right? Because Hebrew thought survives more in our culture in like art and, and poetry and those things, right? Where the point is to take an image that's evocative, that that I can can give this one, one image or one idea to you and it makes you feel a bunch of things, right? And bring up all these associations. And so the, the Hebrew prophets are, are masters of bringing people and, and pushing them forward with these evocative images. Okay. So if you look at some of these, these uh, quite frankly, strange ways that Ezekiel's trying to teach the people Remember, they're not Greek, and he's, he's going to use symbols. So 
you, you look at bones, for instance. Um, this, I don't know if I would touch that. If I, <laughs> this is really, you know, this is kind of gross. It's, it's a, a stinky, it represents death, and he kind of puts it in your face. And he makes it so you can't miss it, at which point now the reader today from a Greek perspective is saying, Ooh, I, I just, I don't like this. It's confusing, it's strange, versus putting on symbolic Hebrew lenses saying, huh, I wonder what that is like in the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and find layer upon layer of possible meaning and then leave your mind and your heart in a position where down the road, you can keep learning more lessons, very similar to our experiences when we go to the temple. Okay. Because the temple, from my view, doesn't seem to have been established as a Greek literal uh, ordinance for us to, to go in and perform these different things in our temple. It's very symbolic. And so if you put on the Greek lenses, you just walk away saying, that was weird. What, what just happened? But if you put on the Hebrew lenses, you walk away saying, hmm, I wonder what God intended for me and my loved ones to learn from this okay. at this stage of our life. And I think if we take an abstract like, like death, right, for the bones, then, then you end up with just one meaning, right? Well, well, you're dead, I can resurrect you, mathematics. We would talked about, though, how part of what Ezekiel do, is doing is showing that this feeling of death, this feeling of exile can end as God breathes life into us, right? So there's something about having the physical bones being confronted with that image that gives you extra emotional layers of information, extra associations and those kinds of layers. And some of these symbols are really designed to tap into that part of you, right? So, so that the symbol itself reminds you of a long history and the way you belong to part of this, this legacy and group. And so with, with one object, Ezekiel can say, here, remember hundreds of years, remember generations, remember what's in Genesis, what happened in the family with the patriarchs. And again, we can compress all these meanings into one, one gesture or symbol, a, a bone or a stick, right? Exactly. Are we done with the bones? Well, I think they're dry. <laughs> okay. they're, they're, we're good. Because we, I, I, I'm, just, I'm just excited with all these props and things. Um, uh, what about the sticks? What can we learn about? Yeah, so if, you, if we turn over to Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 16, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim and for all the house of Israel, his companions. So again, he's evoking an image of this object of two sticks, and he doesn't clarify what it means. So a Greek thinker is sitting here saying, wait, that math equation isn't lining up. What? I don't even know how to start solving your, your equation because I, I don't have the problem well defined. And Hebrew prophets and Hebrew poets love leaving you with a lot of ambiguity and a lot of room for interpretation. So, as an example, we have some sticks here, we'll come up to them. As, as we look at one possible interpretation, and by the way, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we love verse 16 as this comparison of the Bible and the Book of Mormon, and maybe add the Doctrine and Covenants Pearl of Great Price to that. Again, we're the only world faith tradition that has that interpretation because we're the only faith tradition that has this added scripture. Most others would see this as when Israel came into the promised land, they were united as all of these tribes together. They were one. And then at the time of Rehoboam and Jeroboam, there's- That's, that's Solomon's son. Okay. Right? So under Saul, David, Solomon, they were one and then they split under Solomon's son. And then they split into two kingdoms. So let's say you represent a stick, a banner, a standard for Judah, and you represent the northern kingdom of the 10 tribes of Israel called Ephraim in some contexts. Ephraim and Manasseh are up there in the north. And for years, it's not that they were just split, it's that they hated each other. <laughs> they, they, they were enemies and they combined with other nations to fight against their former siblings. And so 
I love the context of, of Ezekiel 37 seems to be this great gathering effort of God saying, no, we're going to bring these two sticks back so that it becomes one banner. This is our real identity. You've forgotten who you really are, and your identity is not just with Judah, and yours isn't just with the ten tribes in the north. It's with the Abrahamic covenant that comes down through the tribes of Israel all combined. So that's one way you could look at 37. So what you're seeing here is as you get into scriptures that are Hebrew and symbolic in nature, you can interpret it there. You could interpret it to say the way we do, which is it could be as simple as two simple sticks, and on one you write Judah, and on the other you write Israel, and there used to be a time when it was one stick, but they've been broken off, and so it's just two sticks. It's not banners or anything, it's just two sticks, and now they become one in your hand. Or you could take our favorite interpretation, which for us as members of the church is a beautiful application to this principle. Even though others may not agree with it, that's, that's totally fine because scripture is, is so deep and broad that it can stand up to all kinds of, of amazing interpretations, and I love this one, where you write on it and you roll up those writings so you would have the stick of Judah. Which is how they wrote back then, so it makes sense. It makes sense in that context, and then you take the stick of Ephraim and you write on that and you bring them together, they become one in your hand. So there's a rich history in our church of interpreting that verse that way, even though others don't, and it's it's beautiful because it's symbolism. And, and one other thing I'd say is whether you're talking about writing or whether you're talking about banners, the sticks do stand for memory and tradition that is then separated and reunited. So we can interpret differently, but a lot of those interpretive layers aren't changing the fundamental meaning, right? Ezekiel got through to all of us. Yeah, okay. There you go. Yeah. That's beautiful. Should we move to the temple? <laughs> go for it. I think we talked a lot about the temple before, okay. but it can be useful for people to have this, this physical visual where we see, here's the Holy of Holies, where the Lord's presence is. Here's the, the court of the priests, where they would have done the sacrifices, and you'd see the smoke mm. coming up from those, those mm -hmm. sin offerings, peace offerings, whatever kind of offering. Here's the, it's called the court of women, where, where all the children of Israel can gather um, in worship to, to come in toward the presence of the Lord, right? So when you have this visual in, in mind, then things like that image of water flowing out through the courts from the presence of God, through the place of sacrifices, to where we all dwell, and then beyond that, right? Coming out of these front gates and, and filling the land. It's just a, a richer visual when you can see the mental image that the first listeners to Ezekiel had in mind. The other thing to consider here is sometimes I think we look at our temple and family history efforts as wow, we are being so magnanimous, we are being so kind and charitable to the people on the other side of the veil who, who have passed on and who need this work to be done for them, and we, we need to discover their stories and, and go and do their work for them, and aren't we great? Which is true, I'm not taking away from that, but the reality is when we go into the temple to do this work, there's, we believe in the ministration of angels. We believe that they can help us in our struggles and in our dry, desolate parts of mortality in life, that it goes both ways. We need them just as much as they need us. And again, it's a Hebrew context that we get our identity by thinking outside of the individual, outside of me here now, and say more of a Christ-like approach of, Lord, who needs me? Who can I help? Who can I bless? Well. There are lots of people around me in the earth that I can bless, but there are a lot of ancestors on the other side of the veil who need me, and quite frankly, I need them. And so this living water, this, this allusion to Christ, all things point to Christ, right? The living water that brings life and love and meaning and richness to that which before was just a desolate desert out there in, in the Dead Sea region. We talked some about how Ezekiel lives as an exile, right? So to someone who's in a Hebrew mindset and identifies themselves through group bonds, 
to be violently pulled out of a place, right? To become a captive, today maybe to be a refugee. That's a big rift. And if you can heal that by linking generations together, that's beautiful. I work with church history, and one of my real interests there is the, the global history of the church. So seeing what, what people in our day, the latter days, how they experience the gospel based on their different experiences and histories in different countries. Uh, I'd done some research at one point on the saints in Cambodia. And Cambodia is a country where in the 1970s there was just terrible violence. I mean, first there was bombing um, from the United States and other countries. So, so you had people living with just the earth shaking all the time. And then internally, the Khmer Rouge regime just killed so many of the people in the country. So lots of people ended up fleeing, becoming refugees. There's just this rupture that they have in common with Ezekiel, right? And one of the results in Cambodia was by the 1990s when the church was getting established there, started in part by a refugee returning. <laughs> he joined the church overseas like an exile and come back, right? Wow. But one thing that happened is people didn't tend to talk about the dead, right? When, when you lost loved ones and sometimes you were separated, you didn't know if they lived or died, it just gets hard. And when that happens, you multiply that to everyone, there's this collective trauma. Well, in the church in Cambodia, when they said, okay, we're thinking about temple now and getting ready to go to the temple and we wanna do work for it and we wanna go meet these people again, suddenly people who for decades had not talked about family, were telling their kids and their fellow ward members, yeah, this is what I remember about my parents. This is what I remember about my grandparents, right? And the temple became the site for that healing where the spirits of the dead could meet the living and things that were unspeakable became part of life experience again. One of the chapters that we didn't cover previously that, that I think is worth our, our effort here is chapter 34. Just to illustrate this connection between Ezekiel and his, his mode of prophesying and Jesus Christ. So you'll notice in chapter 34, it, it starts halfway down through verse two. The Lord says, woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves, should not the shepherds feed the flock. So Ezekiel's saying, I, I sense that part of the reason that we've ended where we've, uh, or where we've gotten to here in Babylon in exile is because the shepherds in Israel didn't feed the flock. They didn't, they didn't lead out, they didn't do what they were supposed to do. And then you, it, there's more in between. And before we move on, I think I wanna say at one level, today we should feel very directly this question. I'm a shepherd in one context yes. or another for the people around me. Am I feeding the flock? And it says, you eat the fat and you clothe you with the wool. You kill them that are fed, but you feed not the flock, right? In other words, I'm benefiting for other people, but am I nourishing them? The diseased have you not strengthened, neither have you healed that which was sick, neither have you bound up that which was broken, neither have you brought again that which was driven away, neither have you sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have you ruled them. Wow. Now, I love in Doctrine and Covenants when Joseph Smith says, when we exercise unrighteous dominion, that's almost a Greek formulation, right? Mm -hmm. We're straight to the abstract. Whenever you exercise unrighteous dominion, amen to the priesthood of that man. And yet there's something really compelling about the way Ezekiel says it, and I can see all these different images and imagine when have I been like a bad shepherd to this kind of sheep? Yeah. When have I let out this kind of sheep? You know, and, and I feel indicted in a different way by this image. Quite frankly, the book of Ezekiel has, in my opinion, one of the coolest closing statements of any book ever written anywhere in the history of the world that I know of. So he, he's finalizing some thoughts and now he's all finished with restoring this new city and this new temple and this new hope and a new heart instead of the stony heart from before. And the, the bones have become flesh and alive and invigorated and the land is, is living, the animals, the plant, everything's wonderful. And he finishes by saying, and the name of the city from that day shall be, the Lord is there. I love that closure, that idea of creating a space 
where the Lord God of Israel can say to us, I'm a part of your home. I'm a part of your family. I'm a part of your life as an individual or a part of your extended family or your ward or your stake. It's that unity, that oneness. I just, I love, I love the symbolism and the picture that Ezekiel has painted for us in this great gathering effort. I love Ezekiel's message too. And I love that he, he grabs you <laughs> mm-hmm. really and says, pay, pay attention to this. And I hope that even across the centuries and all these d- distances of, of culture and sometimes imagery that, that we struggle to understand, somewhere in Ezekiel, I hope people can still feel that in the immediacy of this prophet who, who wanted to grab you and say, the, the Lord is there. I want to tell you things about, about God. You know, I feel like a, a leech sometimes, or I'm just gonna, <laughs> you know, I'm just gonna suck off all of the, the, the time and the effort that you guys have put into studying him. Just, and I love it. How does someone like me come to, to better appreciate and understand some of these, these things on our own, um, so that they, they sink in deep, yeah. um, so that we can then internalize it and try to use it in our, in our everyday lives. I think that's a great question. I think that's the right question to ask. And for me, the answer lies in the Lord Jesus Christ, to have him be the center of all of those scripture study efforts. Because honestly, at the end of the day, we could bring in the world's leading experts on Ezekiel and know all of the history and the language and the culture and the setting and know it inside and outside, backwards and forwards, and translate it into Hebrew even. But if we can't connect it to our Savior in some way where it creates this covenantal connection with us, then we've just become a historical expert. Right. There's nothing wrong with that, but good, better, best, it's way better if you can connect it to Christ. And so if you look at even what we've been talking about with Ezekiel, all of these symbols that point us forward to Christ, well, Jesus would speak in these same Hebrew symbolic ways. He would say things like, I am the living water, or you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. That that is not a Greek way of talking. That's not literal. And I think one really important principle is it's okay to not understand everything, but respect it, Okay. right? If I've left room to be taught, then I can make new connections through my life. So I, I think the most important lesson I would, I would tell people about how do you interpret the Old Testament is you're never going to be done, and that's good, Okay. right? Let those images hang, and if you don't know what to make of them, then wait. And maybe someday you've given God the opportunity to teach you something with that image. Ezekiel evokes the, the ultimate covenant connection with God. Look at verse 30. Thus shall they know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and they, even the house of Israel, are my people, saith the Lord God, and ye my flock, the flock of my pasture, are men, and I am your God. So it's this two-sided covenant. I'm your God, you're my people, and he establishes it in, in in this way where even when they become wayward and break the covenant, he finds ways to reach out and, and gather them back into the covenant. And that's powerful in this imagery of the oneness coming back together, yeah. of the good shepherd bringing the flock all back together. So it's, it's amazing in a Hebrew context, but that's the beauty of scriptures. It's also amazing in a literal Greek context for me and you and you today is that God says to me and you, I wanna be your God. I don't want all these other things in the world to to get your time and energy and devotion and money and your heart. I want you to give it to me and I will save you. I'm the only one who can perform all these miracles for you and provide the the life and the living water for you and the the bread of life. It just shows you that there there is so much joy and when it comes to studying the scriptures and uh, thanks for giving of your time, you know, and your busy life you know, with your work and your kids. Uh, Just really thank you so much for being here with us today as we talked about our two topics, Ezekiel, a prophet in exile, and our second topic, the Lord is gathering his people and giving them new life. And thank you all for joining us at home. We want to again remind you and encourage you to follow through with any feelings that you may have 
received through the Holy Ghost uh, during this episode. Uh, Thanks again, and please join us next week for another episode of Come Follow Up.